Hey everyone, it's Nabil Qureshi and David Wood again with the unofficial Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus video series. Uh, I would highly recommend that you take a look at the official series uh, that you can get through Amazon or you can get this book for more details. Um, right now we're going to cover um, the first objection that I brought to David, um, which uh, when I met him is what sparked our relationship and it's one that a lot of Muslims have had drilled into their heads. Um, at the mosque, which is that the Quran is perfectly reliable. It's never been changed. Uh, in contrast, uh, the New Testament has been corrupted. It's been changed. The Bible no longer says what it used to say. Uh, and for this reason, Muslims can can say, oh, you know, the scripture is, is holy scripture, and Muslims have to believe that it's one of the six articles of faith of Islam, that uh, the books that have been revealed before the Quran are actually holy scripture. Uh, they can hold on to that tenet while also saying, but whatever your Bible says today is not reliable. Uh, I don't have to. I don't have to reconcile what it says with the Quran because it's been changed. Um, that is that is a common belief of Muslims. It's one that I brought to David uh, when when I was Muslim. It was the first one that sparked our conversations together. So, David, how about you give your insight? I'll add my my two cents, and then we'll, we'll close it. Yeah, well, this is uh, back then when we discussed the reliability of the New Testament. We were thinking in terms of textual criticism. Um, if you're claiming it was corrupted, when, 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 when was it corrupted? Who corrupted it? Uh, what's the evidence that it was corrupted? What happens if we compare manuscripts? Uh, thinking along those lines. My thinking has changed over time on that issue when responding to Muslims. And what I mean here is because of the things Muslims are required to believe, you might want to give different responses to Muslims in, in, than you would from other people. So for instance, if an atheist um, said to me, I can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus because miracles don't occur. That would make sense coming from an atheist. And I would respond to an atheist as I would respond to an atheist. I would try to give a case for, uh, for belief in miracles or the existence of God or something like that. Uh, if a Muslim said to me, I can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus because miracles don't occur, I would respond completely differently. My response would be, what are you talking about? You're a Muslim. What, what are you talking about? The Quran, the Quran says, talks about miracles over and over again. What do you mean you don't believe in the possibility of miracles? So notice, I would respond to two people giving the same objection very differently based on the things that, other things that they believe. Um, and what's interesting here is when we're talking about the corruption of the Bible, Muslims don't know that it's more in the realm of saying they don't believe in miracles when they say the Bible's been corrupted in the sense that it's actually contradicting uh, things they're they're supposed to believe in, but they don't know it. And so that's where it comes into us to point these things out to sort of get them to, to think more deeply about this. Uh, because the, the, the bottom line is, uh, Muslims who say the Bible's been corrupted, uh, they've got a problem. They've got a problem on their hands because their texts say that our scriptures haven't been corrupted. Uh, Muslims are aware that the, that, that the Quran affirms the inspiration of the Torah and the gospel, the scripture of the, of the Jews and the Christians. They're aware of that. And that's why they say that our text has been corrupted. If I, That's why I don't say, oh, your Quran's been corrupted as the main criticism of the Quran. I don't believe it was ever inspired to begin with. So I'm not talking about corruption. Muslims say corruption rather than your book was never inspired because they know that our texts are, supposedly were inspired by God, but they also know that our texts don't line up with theirs. So they say that our texts have been corrupted. Uh, the problem is that the Quran doesn't just affirm the inspiration of the Torah and the gospel. The Quran affirms the inspiration and preservation and authority of the Torah and the gospel. So if we're talking about uh, inspiration, uh, and look up, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the passages, I'll give the references, you can look them up. Uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 4 of the Quran say that Allah revealed the Torah and the gospel as a guidance to mankind. So that's something Muslims, even if they're not familiar with the particular verses, they're familiar with the concept that, the, that our scriptures have been inspired, but they believe that our scriptures were subsequently corrupted. That's not what the Quran says. If you go to chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran, uh, Allah says that the Jews and Christians of the time of Muhammad, so centuries after the time of, of Jesus, centuries after the, the New Testament was written, um, Jews and Christians were still reading the Torah and the Gospel because this is where we find references to Muhammad in our scriptures. So we have something that's being called the Torah and the Gospel that is still reliable enough that we could get information about Muhammad uh, from those texts. 
Uh, apart from this, you have uh, a variety of passages in the Quran that talk about no one being able to change Allah's words. And some of these are in the context of books. So chapter 18, uh, verse 27 of the Quran, uh, chapter 6, verses 114 to 115, uh, talk about reading the book and saying that no one can change Allah's words. Recite what has been revealed to you from your, from your Lord. There's none who can change his words. And Muslims here will point out this is, this is only referring to the Quran or uh, you know, Allah's uh, you know, will in heaven or something like this. Uh, but it is talking about book. And even if it's talking about the Quran in context, it's still saying that it's like the, the reason you can trust what the Quran says is that no one can corrupt Allah's words. But if I believe what Muslims say, then what are you talking about? Allah's words have been changed over and over again. All of the, all of the thousands of prophets Allah sent, his words were corrupted over and over every time. What do you mean his words uh, can't be changed or no one can change his words? So these are some passages we, we, we want to think about. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to passages on the present authority of the Torah and the Gospel. And the fact that Christians and Jews, according to the Quran, don't need Muhammad to tell us what to do, which makes no sense if the Quran uh, maintains that our scriptures have been corrupted. So for instance, uh, chapter 5, verse 43 uh, of the Quran, the historical background is that some Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And Allah responds in chapter 5, verse 43, by saying, why are the Jews coming to you for judgment when they have the Torah? And again, in the historical background, the, the historical background is that uh, Muhammad comes and they have like a judgment cushion that the judge of a dispute would sit on. Muhammad comes along and he sits on the cushion. He's the judge. And he tells the Jews to bring me the Torah. And he gets off the cushion, the judgment cushion, and has them put the Torah on the judgment cushion. So the message, according to both the Quran and the historical background, is Muhammad's not the judge. The Torah is the judge. You're Jews. You judge by the Torah. And so Allah says, why do they come to you for judgment when they have the Torah? And goes on to tell them that, uh, that they have to judge by the scripture, the, to the Torah that has come down to them. And if they don't, they're rebels. So that's Allah's message to the Jews. Muhammad is not your judge. The Torah is your judge. Just a few verses later, in verse 47, chapter 5, verse 47, Allah says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. So he says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. So the people of the gospel, that's people who, uh, Christians, we were just talking about Jews, and it switches topics to Christians. We are to judge by the gospel, and if we don't judge by the gospel then we're no better than those who rebel. Now think about these two passages, because if Jews had a corrupt scripture and Christians had a corrupt scripture, these passages make no sense. It should have said, you Jews have corrupt scripture, you Christians have corrupt scripture, don't judge by your corrupt scriptures, judge by the Quran, because now you have a prophet who's giving you brand new revelation uncorrupted. That's not what Allah says. He says, you don't need this new prophet, you've got your original scriptures, which again makes no sense if our scriptures have been corrupted. Goes on in chapter 5, verse 68, Allah says that, uh, that, that, that people of the book have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come down to us. Here again, it makes no sense if the Torah and the gospel has been corrupt, have been corrupted. Why would Allah say we have no ground to stand upon but these corrupt scriptures? It makes no sense. And uh, even more so, uh, the Torah and the Gospel weren't just authoritative for Jews and Christians. They were even authoritative over Muhammad himself. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, chapter 10, uh, he tell, Muhammad was having doubts about his revelations. So he says to, Allah says to Muhammad about these doubts he's having, if you have doubts about the revelations we have, uh, that we have sent you, ask those who read the book before you. So this is Allah telling Muhammad, if he has doubts about his revelations, go to the people of the book. Ask them. So ask them about their revelations. This makes no sense if our revelations have been corrupted. The only way Muhammad's revelations would line up with our corrupt books is if Islam itself were a corruption, which would make no sense. So the Quran is affirming the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah and the Gospel. 
Now, it's very good to go into textual criticism and to show, historically, the reliability of our scriptures, but my first response as a Muslim would be, if you're saying my scripture has been corrupted, why does your God say something very different in the book you say you believe in? And I think that's an important point to bring up. Um, <clears throat> when Muslims have been raised to think that the Bible has been corrupted, um, it's very helpful to point out to them, look, the Quran never actually says that. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll try to bring up verse, I'm, I'm going off my own experience, I try to bring up a verse, where I said, look at this verse here. Here it says that they exchange the words for a lie. Uh, do you know offhand what verse that is? Um, there, there's the, the, most, the most common one is, uh, is Surah 2, verse, um, what is it, 82 or 60? There's, there's the verse where uh, uh, it says that the, the Jews sold, uh, sold their, their scriptures for a small price and so on. Yeah, and so, and so I would point to that verse and say, here's where it says the Bible has been corrupted. Um, but if you take all the verses systematically, of, you know, where the Quran is affirming, look, you have the Torah with you, you have the Injil with you, um, and, and you take those verses which, say, which might say, oh, the, the Bible's been changed. You say, look, this is one book. It's going to try to say something coherent. It's not going to contradict itself. How do I understand these verses? Uh, then it becomes pretty resoundingly clear. The Quran isn't saying that the Bible has been changed and corrupted. Uh, it's saying that the people exchanged the truth of the scripture in their own personal lives for, for paltry prices, for these mm -hmm. fees and for these lies. They didn't follow the scripture that had been given to them. They didn't follow the truth that had been given to them. The Quran isn't saying that the words of the Bible have been changed. Um, and so that was, it's good to point that out to Muslims. Now, David and I have a disagreement of ways here. Um, David thinks this is uh, a knockdown, drag out, that's not the right word, uh, a knockout argument. I would say they have a problem. Uh, not, that it, not that it might convince any particular Muslim, but that uh, as long as your book is saying that I'm supposed to judge by my gospel, it just doesn't make sense for you to tell me not to judge by my gospel. My gospel has been corrupted. And, and, so I, and I, would, I would agree that yeah. it's, that's a problem. I would agree with that. Oh, yeah. so, so, so I would use it in the context of this is one problem among others. But uh, it, it is a way, because at the end of the day, the reason this topic is important is that any doctrine you're defending that, that, that contradicts Islam, right? If you're defending the deity of Christ, uh, doctrine of the Trinity, um, Jesus' uh, death for sins, the resurrection, the, on those doctrines specifically, Muslims have to say, your scriptures have been corrupted. If you can show it from the Bible, they have to say, I mean, there, there are certain things you can bring up and they can try to reinterpret it or something like that. But once you've made an airtight case for some doctrine from the Bible, the only option open to them is to say, your scriptures have been corrupted. So that's them on the offensive. And it's normally Christians trying to, ah, let's go back through here and defend, uh, you know, based on the history of the text, the reliability of our text, when the Muslim's objection really has nothing to do with textual criticism or the manuscript evidence. It's your doctrine contradicts Islam, and therefore it must have been corrupted. And so their actual objection to my doctrine is based on what the Quran teaches them. And therefore I'm saying, well, if your objection is based on what the Quran teaches, you've got a problem because the Quran teaches that my scripture is reliable. And so, so you need to so think a little bit more that's deeply the crux about this. Of that dilemma. My perspective on this issue is there's a different way you can answer it, which I think is kind of a jujitsu move uh, insofar as you're, you're taking the thrust of their objection and you're applying it in such a way where, you, where they realize if they consistently follow out this objection, uh, they're actually establishing a case for Christianity against Islam. Um, and the way I do that, and I talk about some of that in... Uh, in my book, No God But One, um, on the issue of scriptures. So I forget exactly which, uh, which part it is, um, part four, the Quran or the Bible, um, is this. I'll address the issue of, of textual integrity. So has the Bible been changed? No, it hasn't. And I will, I will go through the evidence, the manuscript evidence of the Bible to show Look, this is what it said before. We have manuscripts that go, we have whole Bibles that go back to within 300 years of Christ. Um, you, you have manuscript fragments of Bibles that go within 100 years of Christ. Uh, what they said then, they still say today. Um, you have the Dead Sea Scrolls. What it says is what the Bible says still today. Uh, I'll make that point. And then I'll go from there and say, now you're not comparing, you're not, you're not analyzing the Bible in a vacuum. 
you're comparing it to your scripture because you're not an atheist, you're not an agnostic, you have your own scripture. And if you're saying the Quran is perfectly preserved, whereas the Bible isn't, uh, then we're not just gonna look at the Bible, we should look at the Quran as well, you should look at them both. And then I'll say, when it comes to the Quran, you have at least one tremendous problem with the history of the Quran. And then beyond that, you have scriptural issues which are so problematic that the Bible stands above the Quran, heads and tails, at the end of the day. The tremendous problem is that within early Islamic history, all the Qurans were burnt because of the differences between them. <laughs> this is something that's recorded in the Islamic sources. The most trustworthy source of Islamic history, Sahih al-Bukhari, records this in Book 61. Um, it's volume 5 if you have the old numbering system. Hadith is number 519, 520. But if you look through it, it actually records the fact that all the early Quran manuscripts were burnt because there were differences among them. And then that there was a standard one that was issued. Um, this was something that happened within 20 years of Muhammad's death. And so if you just based on this, and, and no Muslim that I've ever, no Muslim scholar that I've ever approached on this issue, even the ones that I studied under at Duke University, I had a Quran professor that I studied under, no professor that I've ever studied under, no scholar that I've ever talked to has denied that event. Uh, it's so well recorded in Islamic history. So how can you point to the New Testament as having been corrupted when there was never any point in, in Christian history where someone had the ability to edit the Bible on a massive scale? You didn't have anyone who could recollect all the Bibles, change them, and issue a corrupted version. That, that was simply never possible. It never happened. There's no recording of it because it couldn't be done. Um, and that absolutely did happen with the Quran. Uh, it was all recalled, it was all destroyed, and one official version was sent out. Um, if you're going to point the finger at the Bible, you have to point four fingers at the Quran on the issue of corruption. But then beyond that, when you follow the, the, the scripture of, of the Quran, uh, in fact, the scripture of Arabic, Arabic was being developed at the time the Quran was being composed. Uh, it wasn't standardized until the advent of the Quran. The Quran was what standardized Arabic script. Um, and so Arabic had to learn to adapt in order to capture the complexities of verbal speech, written Arabic did, uh, in, in standardized writing. As that was happening, certain Qurans were being considered valid, certain were being considered invalid. Um, you have the time of a man named Ibn Mujahid, approximately 300 uh, you know, years after Muhammad, saying, okay, we've got dozens of, of Qurans out there, we have to limit to, to seven uh, or ten, depending on the story that you hear. Um, could have first been seven and then ten, that's what I think happened. Um, but you, you've got this intentional limitation of how many Qurans are valid, and, and that kept happening up until an official Quran, uh, we, we don't even have to say official, but the Islamic world printed its first Quran in the 1920s. Uh, when that happened, because it was the first one printed, all the rest of the Qurans that were out there uh, lost favor. Uh, for the most part, you still have some that are being used. So Hafs an Asim is the name of the Qirra of the Qur'an that's currently being used. It is different from, uh, for example, Warsh an Nafi, the second most common Qirra that's being used. And Muslims will say, oh, it's just differences in recitation. No, there's differences in meaning. Uh, you actually have differences in the, the meaning of the words. Jay, Jay Smith showed up to a speaker's corner with 26 different Qurans, different Arabic Qurans. Actually, differences highlighted in red and blue. Here's one, here's the other. Putting it right in front of the Muslim saying, look, this one says this, this one says that. That is different from that. Are these the same Quran? Is this the exact same thing letter for letter? And, and you're the staring would at still, two. and they would still deny it. There's no change. Yeah, uh, well, they would at that moment, but when they go home, they're thinking about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for me, the question of scriptural preservation, textual integrity of the Bible, opens up the door to undercut the strongest point of Islamic confidence, and that's the perfect preservation of the Quran. I, as a Muslim, had tremendous confidence in the truth of Islam because I honestly believe the Quran had never been changed. And I would say the vast majority of Muslims have that kind of confidence in Islam because of what they believe to be true about the preservation of the Quran. Um, and it's just simply false. It's, 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 it's a farce when you study the, the history of, of the Quran. Uh, but they, they don't know that. No one's ever told them that. 
And so at the end of the day, their objection presents you with a perfect opportunity not only to defend the Bible, but to show them that the reason for their confidence in Islam is explosively faulty. Um, and, uh, and I think that that, for me, is the preferred way to go. Uh, different people, different approaches. No, with, with me, it's, 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 it's multifaceted, right? It's, uh, it's, now he likes my approach better. No, you, no. See, you see no, 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 how no, convincing no, no, no. it was? No, no, no. It's, it's, here's what your Quran says about my scriptures. Your Quran says this about my scriptures. No, and he's right. So if, yeah, if he, my scriptures are cases, corrupt, present, present if my them. scriptures are corrupt, you've got a problem. Uh, two, let's look at the history of my book. Here's the history of my book. And as Nabil said, there's no, there's no place in there. There's no place in there to have the kind of corruption you need for Islam to be true. There's nowhere in the manuscript tradition where you have a Jesus who didn't die on the cross and didn't rise from the dead. There's nothing like that, right? That's what you need in order for Islam to be true. You don't have what you need. Uh, the differences in the manuscripts of the New Testament are not what you need. You could grant every uh, New Testament variant that people like Bart Ehrman would bring up. Bart Ehrman would say, of course, all of these teach the same thing about the core Christian doctrine. So you never get to what you need as a Muslim. You never get to the level of corruption you need. And then three, if this is what you're saying about, if this, give us the criteria of what counts as a corruption, right? Because you, 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 if you're just saying that textual variants prove corruption, well, guess what? There are textual variants in, in, the, in the text of the Quran. So tell me what you mean uh, by corruption of the text. At the end of the day, all you can honestly say about the history of the New Testament is that there are lots of textual variants because that's just what happens when people are copying books by hand. There are lots of textual variants and you can say that in, in, in deciding the canon, there were some differences uh, with regard to the minor books, right? Because some people, uh, when, when, they, when Christians could finally get together after being persecuted uh, and they said, what books are in here? There was widespread agreement. They had some differences on some of the minor books like 2nd and 3rd John. Um, so there were differences on that. There were people who had never encountered some of the minor books because they weren't used the same way in all churches. And so some people didn't know whether these are scripture or non-scripture. So at the end of the day, that's all you can say. There's lots of textual differences. And you, there were disputes about some of the minor books. Does that mean corruption? If that's what you say, guess what? You have tons of uh, manuscript differences in the history of the Quran, and you had disputes about chapters of the Quran, not from people who came along later, but from Muhammad's original companions. Ibn Masud had 111 we chapters. We've got to the details, man. We've yeah. got to wrap it up. So Muhammad's own companions didn't agree on what chapters were supposed to be in. So if you're talking about disputes about individual uh, chapters, and you're going to use that and say that's what corruption means, fine, the Quran fails that test. So at the end of the day, you have no basis for attacking the New Testament that wouldn't fall right back on the Quran, and therefore you've got all kinds of problems with your claim. No God but one, unit 10. The last unit deals in detail with the issue of Quranic preservation and the problem it poses for, for Islam. There's so much more to get into, so many more details. That's why I'm suggesting these books. Um, but let, let this video just give you some confidence that even the most common objections towards Christianity, uh, when followed to the logical end, actually undercut uh, the evidence for Islam. That's what I found time and time again. That's why I ended up leaving Islam for, for the gospel. So thank you so much for watching this video. On the next one, we're going to cover the next most common objection to the gospel.